Yes guys, how are you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler, Bugsy Malone. He's uh, just over there in the background. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love, for those that you love to do them with. Guys, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Four months or so since I was uploading regularly. I've made a couple of uh, stuttering full starts on this channel, making promises that I'll be back and then breaking them. And I'm sorry for that, you know, not my intention. It's not for the want of trying. I'm just going through a really difficult period. In fact, the most difficult period in my life. Um, by 100x for what it's worth. Not that this is a poor me video at all, that's not my style. Um, I just think it's important to kind of uh, update you guys and also say thank you, which I'll come to in just a moment, um, for the unbelievable well wishes and support that uh, you guys have shown and continue to show in a variety of different ways. And it's been really well received. It's been really um, important and significant in its impact in, in some pretty dark moments that I've uh, had to go through in in kind of peeling back the onion layer of what's happening and what I've been dragged into. Um, it's really a crazy story, which I won't share with you the details of specifically, but you know, to give you a kind of, uh, just a, an oversight into why it's been so difficult is, I, I just wish that the companies that are responsible for your digital security, your web presence, your identity online, and um, the access to like authentication of those resources. I wish that those companies had shown as much support to their customer base as you guys have shown to your um, to, to someone who you don't know, really, most of you don't know me, um, but your, your well wishes have been unbelievable. And like I say, if I haven't spent enough time or had the opportunity to acknowledge them, then I'm really sorry. They may have gone un unacknowledged, but they haven't gone unnoticed. They have been really, really powerful in their uh, in their impact on me. So I want to say thank you for that and um, and make sure that it's uh, sort of recognized because yeah, like I say, it's um it's been it's been it's been really really helpful. Yeah, I just wish that the tech companies would would um, sort of recognize that whilst I get it, I get it. I'm you know, business guy, I understand that that uh, they have trillions of dollars of um, revenue that is attached to narratives around their security and their impenetrable um, models that have may have been true in the past to a degree and or may have been true in the idea of they are stronger some of them are stronger than others but in terms of are they impenetrable the answer is absolutely no and the notion that you are crazy or that you are wrong in your assessment and that you're imagining the things that you know to be true gaslighting is is one of the most uh, most infuriating elements of this process that I'm going through. It is um, wild how convenient it is for certain authority figures or people of influence in this topic, how, uh, how quick they are to, to dismiss you as you know, incorrect or an exaggeration or just wildly off the mark around what is and isn't possible when you know, you know, you know yourself what you're experiencing and you're not a complete Luddite in this regard. Bearing in mind, I did work in the Google Partner Program for six years on three continents, you know, trained thousands of people on uh, complex products, head of global com complex products for the company I worked for. Um, I'm not a developer, I'm not, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, and I'm not a networking expert, but I'm certainly someone who's an expert in topics that overlap into those fields quite a lot. So, you know, I, like I say, I'm not, um, it's not as easy to, to, to convince me that I'm wrong as it would be for other people. Anyway, the tech companies don't want to help you. The police are just as bad. They, um, if they're right in what they tell you, which is that essentially there's nothing they can do to help in terms of communicating with tech companies because the jurisdiction doesn't reach into those parts of the world where those companies are, uh, where their head offices are. So there's no overlap of, in terms of um, enforcement and in terms of investigating people that are probably in Russia or China or wherever they are, um, there's no ability to help you in that regard either. So essentially get on with your life, figure it out for yourself and good luck. You know, as I say, it, it's a bleak picture that it, uh, that it kind of paints for the future of the British public who will increasingly be victims of complex cyber fraud, cyber crimes as AI becomes introduced into an ever present part of our of our um, zeitgeist so you know it's a real concern it's a real concern and the things that I must, I've, I've uncovered guys the uh, 
the the cloak and dagger of it all, the nature and the and the um, the style of uh, of hack that, I've, that I'm figuring out is um, is wild. It's like a sliding doors. It could be out of a movie script. In fact, I'm thinking about you know, given the fact that I've lost my business as a consequence of this, I've lost my livelihood, a lot of my wealth, certainly my privacy, my identity, my memories, digital memories, all gone. You know. And even credibility at some point, you know, people around you think that you're, um, you know, that you're, you're stressed out all the time. And so a different version of you is visible and they don't know the detail, nor do they care or understand. Um, and so they just uh, think that you're, you know, not someone that they really want to spend too much time with, you know, and I get it. Like I'm not, not a, uh, I'm not afraid to recognize that this has impacted my, me in terms of my, um, my attention, my curiosity about other people at the moment, like I say, I've become entirely solo focused. It's almost like um, like a meditation of, of, of sorts where you, where everything's been taken from you and you end up with nothing apart from time on your hands to investigate something that you have to figure out for yourself. Otherwise, no one's going to figure it out for you. And there's no end in sight and there's no future that you can be okay with where these people just have a constant monitoring of your systems and your you know, bank accounts and whatever else, like in everything you're doing. It's, uh, it leaves you with nothing much to do but look into it. And when you're only thinking about one thing, you know, it's, uh, it's a weird, weird place to be. Um, as I say, it's almost meditative and, and uh, kind of cathartic and therapeutic in that you're removing the stresses of everything else until you get a wake up call that comes out of the blue that slams you into uh, the wall like being hit by a truck and that came in the form of um, my dad's uh, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this um, cancer diagnosis that happened a few weeks ago I didn't even know that he was was, was sick you know he, he, uh, he keeps a lot of that stuff to himself and um, yeah he had, he's got kidney cancer he had to have an emergency kidney removed and he's in the recovery process now, but there's complications there. And all of a sudden you kind of like shake yourself out of this, this weird um, zombie kind of mindset where reality kicks back in and um, you realize that there's other things that are more important than, than just, just your own problems. You know, the world keeps on turning and you've got to remember that. And also, like I say, guys, you have to remember the good things as well as the bad you can't be it can't be remiss of you to ignore those that have been there and supported you even if they don't know you and there's no need for them to go out of their way you know out of sight out of mind I've been, I've been gone for four months and so you know to still receive emails from people and stuff saying I hope you're okay Sean we miss you you know it's it's um it's been sensational and I'm sorry that I haven't acknowledged it um previously because it's that's really poor poor form on my part uh but like I say, it took my dad's um, text message and communication to kind of wake me up and get me back into a different a thought process that, you know, it's crazy. And I, I really, I, I know he watches this dad, so I like, you know, keep being strong, my man, keep fighting and um, best wishes to you. And guys, if you guys want to throw a little bit of your support, stop, stop worrying about me and, and send some well wishes his way. I'd really appreciate that as well. Um, but yeah, guys, I just wanted to say, sorry, I've been talking for eight and a half minutes about me. It's, it's not, it wasn't about this. It wasn't the purpose of this, of this um, call. I wanted to just come back out and say, I am going to try and get back at it. I am, I am going to do my best to uh, become more regular and talk about Tottenham. And that's where we're going to go to right now because I have obviously been keeping an eye on you, your thoughts, the channels that are out there, the, the comment sections, and, you know, seeing the... Uh, the usual divided fan base around what's going on at Tottenham. Are we in a good spot? Are we in a bad spot? How far away from the best are we? How close are we to, to, to trouble? What is responsible? Who is responsible? Is it a pizza pie of blame? Is it the same people that always get the unipolar blame game thrown their direction? Is it Ange full? Is Ange Ball capable at this level? Are the players good enough? When you go and beat Manchester City and then you lose to Palace or when you beat Villa and then you lose to Galatasaray or to Ipswich or whoever, obviously it amplifies the natural divide because there's never a week that goes past and in some cases never 45 minutes that goes past where you don't see the very best of what Tottenham's situation can provide and the worst. 
and that volatility has become so uh, compressed in its um, in both sides being given and shown the light that as I say it amplifies both people's perspectives it's never long before someone gets the opportunity to say I told you so on both sides of the hockey and that always creates a great debate so I wanted to get my all's worth in my sort of two cents briefly and uh, let you know where I'm at and I think this is going to be a difficult one because you know I'm someone that thinks that generally speaking with the complexity of what success looks like in football the amount of variables that impact uh, a team's output in a season from obviously tactics and um, injuries and managerial decisions player happiness health um, who they play what happens uh, in terms of European threats, how far they have to travel, the Sunday, Thursday thing. There's so many things, so many variables, like a never ending list of variables that affect the output of a team specifically. And then you have to remember that in the case of the Premier League, there's 19 other football clubs that all have those exact same variables that are influencing them in different ways. Each of those things, those, each of those hundreds of things will have a different weighting. Of influence some of them will be massively influential like losing a key player to a long-term injury losing several in the same position or whatever right massively influential other things that are more um have a, have a lighter weighting but shouldn't be dismissed you know individually maybe not such a big deal but when you compound them on each other they all add up and then as i say you multiply those variables a little bit of math for you here you multiply those probabilities um by each other alongside 19 other times, and you end up with a, what I believe to be one of the most complex um, arguments that surely can't be aligned to one person or one entity's influence as the overarching common denominator of why a team has success or failure. I just think it's too simplistic an argument for something that's too broadly complex in its detail. That said, I genuinely have come to the conclusion that I think and this, again, is difficult because this is a guy who represents everything that on paper I have been calling for <laughs> since in the two and a half, three years that I have been online. You know, I've always said that for me, whilst success is the ultimate gain, uh, aim and, and, uh, and the goal of elite sports, I think that that is a title that is reserved for the people that are participating in it directly, i.e. the managers, the coaches and the players. I think that you are a by proxy a participant in the journey but I don't think that uh, it, I think that there is a, a, a massive difference between the notion of who it is that's, that's lifting the cup you know you are not the guy with your hand on the trophy you're not the guy who is responsible for the success or failure directly obviously you as a fan has influence have influence but and you should use that influence if you're unhappy you should you know make your your voice be heard However, like I say, I think that there is a difference between um, the aim of elite sports for the players versus the fans. And for me, just my take, again, not I would never say other people who think the opposite are wrong. They're not wrong. It's just a different take um, and it's an opinion. But for me personally, I've always said that I for sure would tolerate a trophy one season. I would happily do kind of park the bus, George Graham style football um, for one season if you got us a trophy to get the monkey off your back but as a consistent theme would you sit there and watch Tottenham play that style of football every single game week in week out to win 1-0 and have some level of success not success every season bear in mind if the if the the, the judgment line if the the line in the sand in some people's eyes between what is success and failure is a season that includes a trophy then statistically when you look at the most successful football teams in the history of English football, Manchester United, Liverpool, depending on who you ask and how you value trophies. Um, they, the most successful teams, fail 65% of the time, I think, is around the number. Give or take a couple of percent. 65% of seasons that they participate in football since their inception, they have failed to win a trophy. And if they are the most successful teams, then every other team has failed more frequently than that. And so if that is a barometer of what success and failure, failure looks like, then would you tolerate George Graham boring football every week, week in, week out, 
only to see your team, not you specifically, but your team put their hand on a trophy and lift it less than 30% of the time at best. To me, that's a trade-off that isn't worth it. As someone that uses football as a release, as a distraction, as a, as a way to attach yourself, again, by proxy, indirectly, to something that you have very little control over, but something that you are uh, invested in. It's nice to have something that you're invested in, that you have an emotional attachment to, but that you yourself are not responsible for the outcome of, that you can be a participant, an observer of the journey, um, but not directly responsible for the destination. And that thought process, to summarise, brings me to the idea that, and why I always said, I need to see good football as the, the cornerstone of what I'm watching as a Tottenham fan, and that hopefully that should never be sacrificed in the pursuit of success and will hopefully lead to it. But success itself is not worth it if you are sacrificing what is important to you, which is consistent, regular entertainment as a fan. And I wanted something like Ange. However, I don't think that Ange is the guy. I don't. I'm sorry to say that to the Australian guys that are watching this. I'm sorry to say that for those of you who think that I'll be a flip-flop for saying it. It's not that. I do like the guy. I like him. I have a little bit of a problem. I've always had a bit of an issue since the first time I saw him with his interview styles, his techniques. I'm not a fan of the fact that he looks at the floor all the time and doesn't really like eye contact. That's irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, but it's something that, you know, it's always been a little bit of a bugbear. But I also don't like the way that he um, handles his personality that has the ability to be so warm and kind and welcoming when he's happy following a win. He's funny and jovial. After a loss, he can be very almost moody, sulky, one word answers. And I think Jamie O'Hara is correct when he says that we deserve more from a manager than one word answers that are not, you know, even acknowledging that there's things to learn or reasons why it didn't go quite as well as it could have done today. Hi guys. Um, and that to me is a bit of a, again, like a bugbear, but it's not the reason I think that he's not the guy. The reason I think he's not the guy is because I think he's too attached to the notion of it's who we are, man, or who we are, mate. It's, uh, it's part of his brand of football, of, of personality. And obviously for him, it's important to have a brand. It's always important to have a brand and his is good football, you know, un, like, unashamedly, unashamedly, um, stubborn in the pursuit of attractive football but to the point where I think it's going to hold him back at this level I don't think you're ever going to win a trophy certainly not the league by beating Manchester City and by losing to Ipswich you can't have that inconsistency and that volatility in output and expect a trophy even on a cup level the fact that Tottenham struggle against weaker teams that have no option but to sit in and, and be resilient and kind of take the game in a different direction, then on a cup level, there's too much of a um, that variable, that weighting of who you play, who you get in the draw. Too much of that will factor in, i.e. luck, will factor in to whether or not Tottenham can win a cup. And... You know, for all those people that say Tottenham used to win so much more success in the old days than we do under Daniel Levy, well, a lot of that was cups. And so, for me, I just, I just think that the unnecessary dependency and reliance and um, unrelinquishing belief in attractive all-out football at all costs, the pendulum has swung too far. From Conte to Ange Postacoglu, I think it's moved too far in one direction. And that's okay though. And I'll come to why that's okay in a second. But I do think that he has made a rod for his own back with this, this brand and this nature and narrative of we're not gonna change who we are ever. Because I don't think in a cup competition when you get to the semi-finals and you have to go away to a Turkey or in the Champions League to a Real Madrid or anywhere really. Um, you know, you, if you ask the hundred managers that have had success in Europe, what do you do if you get away, go away to Real Madrid in the first leg of a semi-final? 100 out or 99 out of 100 will say you keep it tight all right you don't go after real madrid because they'll put the game to bed and then you won't have any chance of recovery in the second leg 
Ange wouldn't do that. Ange would say, we'll play our game. And I just think that that lack of, um, almost like a lack of respect for, for the opposition um, that is dressed up as a pure belief in pure football is, like I say, it's unnecessary and it will inevitably lead to a downfall at this level. I just think that the, the game is different at this level. I know he has every reason to believe in his philosophy because it's been successful wherever he has been. But if you were to use the same revision style and homework style uh, for your GCSEs or for your A-levels or for your university as you did for your GCSEs, then I think you're going to come unstuck. You know, there's a different... Hi guys, sorry about that. Um, this is jumping now back into uh, the home because the SD card on my, on, my, uh, on my, my camera thing was full up. So I was just getting into the flow of things. Where was I? Uh, I'll sort of round this off. I just think that Ange, um, it requires a different outlook. It requires something more, something more contextual that is lacking. I think that this team has the most potential of any team that I can remember uh, being familiar with in my lifetime. Comparable maybe in talent, obviously different levels of strength in certain areas, but under the Poch season four team or season three team, you know, similar in sort of style and potential, maybe different weightings attached to different sorts of areas. But in terms of outside of that particular group of, of players, the best in 40 years for me. And we've got so much time on our side with these young prospects that are coming through. Maybe we need a bit more backup in one or two areas, but it's we've closed the gap between our first 11 and our squad whilst also maintaining uh, a, a relative strength, a distributed strength and skill set across the squad. Obviously, not replacing Harry Kane with a Harry Kane replacement is uh, was always going to be impossible. But in Dominic Solanke, I think you have someone whose value sometimes goes a little bit understated, but shouldn't, because in, in reality, the guy's work ethic and effort is in, uh, insane. It's incredible. And he's very valuable to a system that looks something like this or this itself. And therein, I think, is, the, is, the, is where I'm going to land, right? So I personally think that if the squad is capable of taking on the best at their own game, at their own style and beating them, but is also in the same game, or in the same week, or in the same uh, period of time, capable of like just looking completely out of sorts against some of the weaker teams in the Premier League. The potential, the capability, and the uh, the uh, the sort of demonstration, the evidence to support the notion that it's good enough is and has been presented. The fact that it's not there consistently enough is obviously an area that needs work, but also will come with time as these players have more and more time together. The familiarity, as I've said before, on I think on Last Word on Spurs, shout out to you, Ricky. Thank you for the invites over the last uh, few months. Um, I think that the the inconsistency, some of that comes from confidence, and uh, the improvement of confidence in certain players. Some of it comes from time together because the like this particular style of football requires um, a lot of wavelength, uh, anticipation and reading of each other's games because the players are encouraged to create unorthodox uh, football. It's you're kind of free to and encouraged to take poetic license to the next level in Angeball, whereby you are given a framework with which to operate certain rules that you don't do this, you don't set back, you maybe invert, whatever. But generally speaking, the way that the game is um, allowed to represent itself or our style is allowed to represent itself outside of the framework is over to the players. And because of that, there's a lot of responsibility for the players to be able to kind of read each other's minds and, and do things that are unpredictable that players in certain positions wouldn't typically do. And that, as I say, is a lot of responsibility, which will hopefully be ironed out and improved upon over time. I just think that the major weaknesses in our game come from unnecessary vulnerabilities that could be ironed out with more context baked into the game management and the decision making that I don't believe will happen because I think that any unwinding of the it's who we are mate will be damaging to brand Poster Coglu and he has a career beyond Tottenham to think about and so I think that you sometimes will cut your nose to spite your face if you are stubborn because you prioritize um, ego based issues over you know what's good and what's necessary Please don't confuse the idea that he doesn't change 
with the idea that the tactics don't change. I 100% have seen some adaptation in season two of the tactics. There is variation with regards to the fullbacks, the width, certainly some of the players coming in and doing different things. There's lots of variation that has occurred, but the framework, the philosophy is where the um, the sort of re the reluctance to adapt uh, sits. And I think that is in and of itself, obviously therefore aimed at the guy who created the philosophy and where I have my issues. Do I think that Ange should should go? No, I'm not Ange out. I'm happy to see it through. And I hope that, like I say, with the consistency and the confidence and the time, I think that hopefully we will win more than we lose and we'll enjoy the enjoy the, the story as it unfolds. But do I think that we will have consistent success with Ange at this level? I'd say no. Do I think we could maybe pick up a trophy along the way? Possibly. And of course, I'm rooting for that. But here's where I land. I, I said this ages ago as Conte was walking out after his, um, believe me, believe me, nothing changes. Uh, as he walked out, I said the next guy will fail. It doesn't matter whether we pivot to the next philosophy, the right philosophy, the getting back to good football at its foundation and cornerstone. That philosophy is important and I can't wait to see it. This is before I, like, Ange was on the radar. But I said, whoever that guy is, the pendulum will have to swing. And it will be too far before you come back and land somewhere closer to what is necessary for success. But to change the philosophy from one to the other, you need a momentum swing that probably takes you too far in the first instance. And so I said that the next guy will fail, but hopefully he will have a squad that he can inherit that will be able to take the next guy to... Uh, the promised land and take us Tottenham fans with it as a impartial or maybe a partial but an observant uh, of the story and by proxy a participant in it. I hope that the next guy will have the same general over um, overview regarding um, all-encompassing good football but that it also bakes in context and has some degree of, of variety and, and, and plan B baked in where um, we never sacrifice our our, uh, our beliefs, but that we also, you know, take into context the um, and, and show respect for the variety that can come from the other side, the other the other uh, team on the pitch. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope that you understand that whilst I acknowledge that you will call me a flip flop, some of you that I'm not saying that it was wrong to move in this direction, and I'm certainly not saying that I was okay with Conte ball. Yuck! Get rid of it. I just hope that whoever the next guy is that he will take the, the, the crop of potential and they will have had more time playing attractive football and learnt each other's game. And the next guy doesn't need to tinker too much with the philosophy. As I said, there is a difference between Arnie Slot and what he's doing at Liverpool and the challenge that Ange Postacoglu had to face at Tottenham. Jurgen Klopp created something phenomenal with a squad and a club and a a company, an organisation that is used to success, that has a constant 50, 60 year us against the world mentality, um, you know, politically, Liverpool, all of these things that, that there's something different about, about the, the Liverpool ecosystem. And Jurgen Klopp left that club with a significant amount of momentum that the next guy didn't have to rewrite or re-change the course. He had to plot his own path for sure but he didn't have to um, catch a falling knife. There was a lot of momentum on Liverpool's side, and this guy's come in and taken advantage of what has materialised this year, which is Arsenal you know, not being quite as dominant, things happening there. The variables that are affecting them have had an impact. Also, Manchester City, four losses on the bounce. When was the last time that happened? Is that a sign that Pep Guardiola might be moving on and there's a kind of undertone there around that, that change has to happen? What about their... Um, their day in court maybe that's something that's having an impact as it as its proximity approaches I don't know but there was an opportunity for someone to to grab uh, this year and it looks like it was Liverpool that um, have done it it could have been Tottenham but probably isn't going to be I'm not comparing Postacoglu to Arnie Slot though because Postacoglu had to catch a falling knife Tottenham Hotspur were on its knees as an organisation after Conte and it was a bit of a mess, a lot of a mess, to be honest. And let's be honest, he's come in a breath of fresh air. He won over the fans very quickly with his brand of football and the relative success that we had early on. However, 
as time has materialised, I think that the kind of cracks have begun to show for me. And I just worry whether or not he is the guy that can take us that, to that next level. But I think he was a necessary cog in that pendulum pivot. But I'm not going to criticise him because for me, he's trying to catch a car that's rolling down the hill and push it back up. Whereas Arnie Slot is inheriting something that has a, a whole different set of um, considerations and his cocktail tastes very different. Guys, I'm going to leave it there. Long rant. I apologise uh, for my absence. I will be back as often as I possibly can. And God willing, this will be something that is in the past going forward. I appreciate you listening. I hope you are all um, having a wonderful week, whatever you're doing. Come on, you Spurs. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always...